horror movie heroes aren't supposed to be perfect. By and large, they're just people, and while you root for them because they are just people, they're also capable of making some pretty bozo mistakes, and in some cases, those mistakes can actually lead to some pretty dire consequences. So with that in mind, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 horror movie heroes who made everything worse. Number 10, Ash Williams' Army of Darkness. Army of Darkness opens with our boomstick blasting hero, Ash Williams, transported to medieval times. After consulting the wise man, Ash learns that he can return to his timeline by retrieving the Necronomicon and uttering three words, those being Klaatu Barada Nikto. Pretty easy, right? Well, for anyone other than Ash Williams, it would be. Famously though, in Army of Darkness, when he locates the book after a series of, let's say, shenanigans, Ash realises that he's actually forgotten the last part of the enchantment. Out of desperation, Ash just mumbles the phrase, hoping it'll be close enough to trigger the spell. Instead though, Ash's fumbling actually summons a malevolent doppelganger called Evil Ash and a legion of deadites. As expected, Ash unites these citizens and eventually leads them against the Zombie Legion, ultimately destroying them and his own Dark Twin. But even though Ash himself is hailed as a hero, it doesn't change the fact that he unleashed evil Ash's forces onto the world because he couldn't remember three words. At least have someone write it down in your remaining hand or something, Ash. Like, do the bare minimum. Number 9. Mika. Paranormal Activity. In Paranormal Activity, Katie tells her partner Mika that she senses a dark spirit in their house. This revelation inspires the boyfriend to set up a camera at night to capture footage of any supernatural phenomena. Straight off the bat, this is a bad idea, since making contact with an evil presence never ends well, does it? Well, unfortunately, Mika is unable to temper his curiosity since he keeps interacting with the spectre. And when Katie consults a psychic, Dr. Fredericks, he tells her the incorporeal force is a demon, meaning that she and Mika shouldn't communicate with it unless a demonologist is present. And again, instead of leaving the entity alone, Mika uses a Ouija board to speak to it directly. And over time, the demon becomes more aggressive and violent, I mean, who knows why? All the while, this guy continues to piss the entity off even more. And despite Katie's pleas, he just outright refuses to move out the house. And after putting up with the haunting for 21 days, it's no surprise when he gets killed by the demon. Number 8, Melody, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022. 2022's Texas Chainsaw Massacre kicks off with a group of Gen Z contractors selling off property in a rundown burg called Harlow. Lead entrepreneur Melody and her sister Lila enter a derelict orphanage to inform the owner Ginny that she's been evicted. This naturally causes an argument to break out, which is interrupted by Ginny's carer, who just so happens to be Old Man Leatherface. Ginny becomes so agitated by this argument that she actually dies from a heart attack, and as such, enraged, Leatherface whips out his chainsaw and goes on another killing spree. Now, we will let Lila off the hook for this one, but Leatherface's lust for revenge against the rest of the young adults is kind of justified. Although it wasn't intentional, Melody did try to evict an old lady from her home in order to gentrify the area, which led to the death of the only person that this deranged cannibal actually cared about. Considering Melody didn't seem to care about booting this old woman out of her house, you don't really sympathize for her all that much, but it gets worse as Leatherface's killings grab the attention of the final girl from the first film, Sally Hardesty, who, eager to exact her revenge on her tormentor from long ago rushes to Harlow as soon as she can. But seconds after arriving, Leatherface rams his chainsaw right through a gut and kills her dead. So if Melody and Co. didn't come to town, a lot of good people, including the franchise's original hero, wouldn't have chainsaw-shaped holes in their bodies. So yeah, thanks guys, good job. Number 7, Burt Cabin Fever. Many a horror film has at least one character that's an obnoxious jackass through and through, and in Eli Roth's Cabin Fever, Bert fits the bill to a T. Now admittedly, because he hunts squirrels and makes very dated jokes at any given opportunity, you might wonder how on earth this guy can qualify as a hero. 
But since he is the only one with the common sense to leave the woods after he learns its inhabitants are infected with a flesh-eating virus, you have to give him some credit. And he's also the only member of his party to actually ask for help and seek out a hospital for his friends. However, that doesn't change the fact that Bert is mostly responsible for the virus getting out of hand. After he comes into contact with an infected hermit, Bert runs away. Unfortunately, this compels the hermit to track him down, allowing him to infect his friends. And when Bert warns a shop owner about the virus, they alert the police who then gun down his buddies. And so, even though Bert often acts before thinking, he manages to cause more damage every time he tries to be sensible and helpful. Number 6, Jeff Saw 3. It's impossible not to feel bad for Saw 3's protagonist, Jeff. Not only was his son killed by a reckless driver, but that driver got away scot-free due to an incompetent judge and an eyewitness who refused to testify. As such, Jeff fell into such a deep depression that his wife eventually left him. So when Jigsaw gives Jeff the chance to come face to face with those who wronged him while taking part in his game, we assume that the grief-stricken father will have his vengeance. However, Jeff rises to the challenge and refuses to be a pawn in Jigsaw's sick game, and as such, tries to save each person who helped destroy his life. Despite Jeff's noble intentions though, he is, well, he's a bloody idiot and ultimately makes every wrong decision imaginable. You might have noticed that I said he tries to save each person who destroyed his life, and that is true, he definitely does. But does he ever succeed? Well, no, he fails pretty much every test and gets all of them killed anyway. And out for blood at the very end, Jeff eventually finds Jigsaw, who's undergoing brain surgery, and slits his throat. To Jeff's horror though, he realizes that the surgeon is actually his ex-wife, and is wearing a collar that's programmed to explode if Jigsaw's heart stops. So by killing Jigsaw, Jeff inadvertently blows his own wife's head off. Now, admittedly, Jeff didn't know this link for certain, but his final test was to spare Jigsaw's life, and if he did, it was promised that his family would be safe. It's one instruction, Jeff. You were so close, you went through so much, but you ultimately went down the bloodlust route. Number five, the Sandines, the Purge. In The Purge, the new US government passes a law to legalize all crime for one night in an attempt to, uh, lower crime, so for 12 hours, burglary, arson, and murder is all a-okay. Now, if you, yes, you, lived in a city where killing was legal, you'd probably want to take every precaution possible, or maybe even leave the country outright if you could. And our heroes of the movie, the Sandin family, do have enough money to transform their huge house into a safe zone with state-of-the-art security systems. But the question is, why risk staying there at all? If you've got that much money, why not just lock up and get yourself a couple day holiday abroad instead? Putting that aside though, the family also discard every survival instinct imaginable while in the home. Instead of waiting out the purge in a safe room, the family decide to split up, because that's always a good idea, and when the youngest Charlie learns a man outside has been attacked by a mob, he disables the security system to let him in. And unsurprisingly, Charlie's decision leads the mob straight to their doorstep. And when the gang leader orders the father James to let them in, he reluctantly agrees, alerting his family that the house actually can't withstand an assault. But wait, let's break this down. If the house can't stop a break-in, why the hell did they stay there in the first place? Why would anyone stay in their house during the purge unless it was fortified enough to resist a full-scale attack? I mean, have you seen what happens during the purge, my guy? Have you seen these movies? It's not good. It's not good at all. Number four, Freddy Harris Halloween Resurrection. Buster Rhymes' Freddy Harris from Halloween Resurrection may very well be the most annoying character in the whole franchise, but he is technically the hero since he's the one who defeats Michael Myers with a karate kick. Yes, that actually happens. But Freddy could have put an end to the masked madman's killathon much sooner. As in the first act, we see that Freddy is producing a reality show where the contestants must spend the night in Michael's former home. Freddy tries spooking the participants by dressing up as Michael himself, oblivious that the real Michael Myers has broken in. So when Freddy comes mask to mask with the knife-wielding psychopath, he just assumes that he's the cameraman in costume and lets Michael go. But it's worth noting, by the way, that 
by this point, Michael has already slaughtered three people. Because Freddy is obsessed with the show making money though, it takes him hours to realize that Michael has actually murdered most of the contestants. And even though Freddy does, like I said, save the day with Kung Fu, Michael Myers could have been stopped much sooner if it wasn't for Freddy's incompetence, stupidity, and of course, greed. Also, I mean, it goes without saying that if Freddy didn't orchestrate this reality show to begin with, which is kind of in bad taste, may I add, it wouldn't have enticed Michael to return home in the first place. Number three, Tommy Jarvis, Friday the 13th, part six, Jason Lives. After Tommy Jarvis killed Jason Voorhees in the falsely advertised Friday the 13th, the final chapter, it looked like the hockey mask wielding maniac was dead for good. But in the sequel, A New Beginning, Tommy learns that there's a masked madman slaughtering people in the area in a manner eerily similar to Jason. When Jarvis is confronted by the killer during the climax though, he realizes it's fine, Jason isn't back. Well, it's not fine, people still died, but Jason isn't back as it's just a copycat and Jason is really dead. However, Tommy still refuses to believe that Jason really is deceased, and because he can't just leave well enough alone, Tommy drives to Jason's grave in the next movie, hoping to cremate his remains. And after opening the casket and looking upon Voorhees' worm-eaten, maggot-infested body, Tommy should finally accept that his tormentor can no longer hurt him, right? Well, instead, Jarvis impales the rotting corpse with a fence post, and after the post is struck by lightning, Jason is actually revived into a super strong, unkillable version of himself. Naturally, terrified out of his mind, Tommy runs off to warn the residents that Camp Crystal Lake's most prominent killer has risen from the grave. But whose fault is it, Tommy? Whose fault is that? <laughs> like, you can pass the book. You did this. This is all you, my friend. Anyway, although Tommy is the film's hero, you can't help but get angry with him, just like I did there. Not only did he go out of his way to dig Jason up, even if you didn't realize that he would accidentally resurrect him, he also made the machete-wielding lunatic more powerful than ever. Again, good going, man. Number two, Billy Peltzer, Gremlins. In Gremlins, the rules for looking after a mogwai are extremely simple. You gotta keep them out of the light, you can't get them wet, and you should never feed them after midnight. And considering the dire consequences of not abiding by these rules, hero Billy Peltzer takes a rather relaxed approach while looking after his mogwai, Gizmo. Despite the fact that light can kill the adorable critter, Billy takes minimal precautions to keep Gizmo in darkness. And Billy only has his pet for a day before a glass of water spills over him, causing Gizmo to spawn a litter of naughty mogwai. Now, alright, you might think that Billy should be cut some slack here. I mean, after all, he wasn't told what would actually happen if the little furball got wet. But once he does see the ramifications of this action, what does he do? Well, he takes one of Gizmo's offspring to his former science teacher and then deliberately drips water onto him again. Unsurprisingly, this action leads to the teacher's death later on in the movie. Despite pleas not to feed the creatures after midnight, no matter how much he begs, no matter how much he pleads, Billy gives them some grub after the allotted time as well, causing them to mutate into killer gremlins. Because of Billy's, let's call it, gross negligence, he transformed this quaint little town into a gremlin-riddled nightmare within days. Number one, Dana and Marty, the cabin in the woods. On the surface, the cabin in the woods looked like a by-the-numbers horror flick. A bunch of college students, composed of a promiscuous female, a jock, a nerd, the stoner, and a virgin, head to a deserted cabin to party, only to awaken a horde of zombies. The monsters pick off the group until only two remain, Dana, the virgin, and Marty, the stoner. After they escape, they discover everything they experienced was orchestrated by a secret organization as part of an annual ritual. See, this ritual requires a sacrifice of five slasher archetypes in order to appease a godlike race called the Ancient Ones. The Cabal's director tells Dana and Marty that they can avert the apocalypse by finishing the ritual. But to the director's surprise and horror, the pair reject her offer, believing humanity isn't worth saving anyway. So the incomplete ritual incurs the wrath of the Ancient Ones and causes them to burst through to the surface, ending the world as we know it. And look, we totally understand why Dana and Marty didn't want to die for the sake of some cosmic ceremony that they'd never even heard of. But since it resulted in the extermination of the entire human race, they certainly did make things worse for pretty much everyone living peacefully without knowing that all this was going down. 
So, that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. What do you think about the actions of these heroes? And are there any daft ones I missed off here? Let me know, and while you're down there, if you could, please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't thought, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.